Hi folks, welcome back. This is the third part of the series on integrating research into your papers. Remember in the first lecture we talked about how to find sources, then we talked about how to evaluate the sources. In the, uh, this part here we'll talk about how to integrate those sources into your own writing. Now there's a few situations where you always have to cite where you found your information. Most obvious is if you have some kind of specific evidence, some specific uh, data that you're alleging. Uh, the most obvious one is a statistic that you quote, or a, a, a number. So if I said 12% of students don't cite sources correctly, well, then you should wonder, where did you get that 12%? Whenever somebody quotes a statistic, you know, unless they just made it up, uh, it always has some kind of source and they need to uh, be cited. Same thing with a specific number. So if I just said, well, there's, you know, millions of uh, vehicles in the United States, I probably wouldn't need to cite that because it seems fairly commonsensical. However, if I gave a very specific number, you know, if I said something like there are, you know, 6.72 uh, 6 uh, million vehicles in America, well, where did that number come from? It's a little too specific just to be, uh, you know, an average. So I must have gotten it from somewhere, so I need to cite that information. So basically, statistics and specific numbers need to be cited. A quotation also needs to be cited. Uh, if you put something in quotation marks, that indicates that you got it from somewhere else. So you always need to cite the source. And then finally, if you are quoting uh, the results of a study, so if I said something like, studies have shown that smoking leads to increased risk of cancer, well, what studies? You know, I'm quoting some results from some studies, so it would make sense, and in fact, it's uh, required for me to cite where I got those results from. Also, if you borrow material from somewhere else, and basically any information that's not known to the, the masses, if it's not common knowledge, if you had to look it up, uh, then you need to uh, put where you got it from. So I'll give you some examples to help you understand this. So the first example here, 50% of the 424 participants taking vitamin D supplements were cured of cancer after two weeks. So those are the uh, statistics I told you about. Where did the 50% come from? 424 participants. You know, it's obvious that I got this from somewhere, so I need to cite the information. Uh, the noted linguist Carl Gustav claims that Shakespeare's plays were written by at least three different people. Now there, I've uh, mentioned somebody, Gustav. You know, obviously this isn't uh, something I came up with, and I, I want to cite this guy because it makes me look more credible, it makes it look like I've done some research, so I cite him. Uh, the last example, a massive study conducted at the Smith Institute showed that creatine is linked to kidney disease. So again, this is these uh, results I'm talking about. So I looked at some study, this was the result of the study, so I need to cite the, the study. Here's some borrowed material. According to Smith, comma, Shakespeare's play Macbeth contains words and structures not found in any of his other plays. So again, there's reasons to cite this uh, beyond just avoiding plagiarism. I, I need to show that I've done some research and I found this article by someone named Smith. It makes me look more credible if I cite it than if I just uh, come up with stuff on my own. A comma splice is, quote, an error in which two independent clauses are joined with a comma but no conjunction. You know, again, this is something that most people probably don't know right off the top of their heads. So if you just saw this sentence somewhere, you'd probably think you must have gotten it from somewhere. So where did the information come from? Uh, this who uh, Jones. Okay, and here's some uh, specific facts. And this is where it really starts to confuse students because this idea of common knowledge is confusing, right? How do you know if it's common knowledge or not? It's, if you don't know it, does that mean that it's not common knowledge? Or if you know it, uh, does that mean that it is common knowledge? Uh, basically, you have to put your, your uh, you know, put on the reader's spectacles for a minute and think, what would that reader expect you to know and you to have to look up? So here's just some examples. Uh, Hillary Clinton lived for six years in New York City before moving to Rhode Island, where she lived for only two months. Now, here is some very specific information. You know, we've got this two-month time span. Uh, I don't, you know, there's not very few people in the world that, follow Hillary Clinton's movement so uh, closely that they would know something like this. So you obviously need to cite a source for that. Uh, there are 242 different creatine supplements currently on the market. Now if I just said there are many different creatine supplements, I wouldn't need to cite that. That uh, would be considered common knowledge. Uh, but the fact that I gave a very specific number, 242, uh, you know, that means that I got it from somewhere, right? That's not just a random uh, number. 
Uh, last year, comma, Microsoft Office sold over 4.2 million copies. So again, we have that very specific number. If I just said last year, Microsoft Office sold well, you know, maybe it would need a, a source, maybe not. Uh, I would probably lean in that case towards saying it needs a source. Because again, you know, how do you know that it sold well? Have you looked at some charts, uh, some kind of sales figures, you know, where the information come from? But I guess uh, if you said, though, a Microsoft Office is a word, is a, you know, productivity suite, you wouldn't need to cite that. If you said Microsoft Office is a best-selling uh, productivity tool, uh, you wouldn't need to cite that because, you know, lots of people uh, know that without having to look it up. Okay, so here's some examples, and I'll run these by you, and you can try to ask yourself, uh, do you need to cite something or not? So George Washington was the first president. Okay, you don't need to cite that because almost everybody knows that. Okay, second example. Abraham Lincoln was president during the Civil War. Again, no citation necessary. Now, just because you don't happen to know this doesn't really matter, and most people do. Okay, third example. Ford Motor Company is one of America's oldest car manufacturers. No citation necessary. Uh, pretty much everybody knows that. Michael Jackson sold millions of records. Again, you know, it's almost anybody that knows anything about music know the guy uh, sold millions of records, so no citation necessary. Uh, now compare that to these examples. Last year, Ford Motor Company's sales fell 4.2%. Need to cite that. It's just not a it's not an average, it's not common knowledge, it's a very specific figure. Uh, the company's sales have risen and fallen over the years. Now, no citation necessary for that. You know, almost, uh, you know, everybody knows uh, that the company's sales go up and down over, over time. Uh, three, John Deere makes a variety of lawn equipment. No citation needed. Pretty much everybody knows that. Uh, four, there are Walmart stores in almost every town in America. Don't need to cite it, it's common knowledge. Uh, five, though, there are uh, 42,204 Walmart stores in the U.S. Okay, there again, you know, that's a very precise uh, figure. You must have gotten it from somewhere, so we need to have a citation. Okay, so now that that's clear, uh, there's three ways to integrate sources into your writing. Uh, one is the direct quotation. Uh, the second one is the paraphrase, and then we'll talk about summarizing. Now, direct quotations are basically you just copy and paste the source. You type it in word for word. And they're always uh, couched between uh, quotation marks. So Barton writes, comma, good writers know when to quote and when to paraphrase, quote. And then I've got the citation there, three, uh, 234. That's the page number where I got the uh, quotation. Note that there's no, in, there's no period inside the quotation marks. Uh, that goes after that uh, parentheses. Okay, so some facts about doing this. Uh, if you have an MLA, which is what most of your English classes will use, you always need to have the author there somewhere and the page number. Now, usually you'll have a page number. Even if you use those online databases, remember, remember from the second lecture, I told you to get the PDF versions, which will have the page numbers on it. If, uh, though, for some reason it doesn't have page numbers, if you just have to quote this website and there's no page numbers, uh, then you don't worry about the page, but you still have to have the author information. Now, inside that citation, you, need to you either put the author's name or you don't. Uh, you put it if you don't mention the author somewhere else in the sentence or in the, earlier in the paragraph. Uh, you don't put it in, though, if, you, <laughs> if you've already mentioned it. That would just be repetitive, right? So look at the first example. Barton writes, always include the page number. So we just have 82 there, because I've already said Barton. I don't need to say it again. Uh, the second example, though, one scholar writes, comma, always include the page number. So there I just said one scholar. I didn't give the name, so I had to put that inside the parentheses. Now ellipses are the dot, dot, dot. And they're generally pretty easy to use, but some students get confused. And they think that they need to put them before or after a quotation. Uh, you don't need to do that. Uh, everybody knows if you have a little quotation, uh, obviously that's not the whole book, right? They know that something came before the quotation, something came after it. So don't worry about it. Uh, just start to you know, quote what you're going to quote. Now, if you, you do use ellipses, though, if you take a piece out of the middle of the quotation. So look at that second example there. Barton writes, ellipses are easy to use, dot, dot, dot. Just learn a few simple rules. So... I took something, there was something between those two parts of that quotation. Uh, I want to let the reader know, hey, I took a part out. 
And now the square brackets, uh, these keys are next to your, at least on my keyboard, next to the P. And they're used if you want to add something to a quotation that's not actually in it. So a good example there is uh, Barton writes, comma, this punctuation mark, square bracket, the comma, square bracket, has confused many writers. So I'm letting the reader know, if he or she went to that book, looked at page two, they would not see that the comma part in the brackets. I just added that so it would be clear to the reader what I was talking about. A second example, uh, Barton writes, uh, quotation marks, bracket, the comma, uh, close brackets, has confused many writers. So there I took out the this punctuation mark, just replaced it with the comma, saved a little space, you know, it's very clear. Uh, but again, you have to signal to the reader, hey, you've changed this quotation. If you don't do that, uh, then they'll think you're trying to alter the meaning. Now the biggest mistake students make when they're <clears throat> quoting something directly is to just have a standalone quotation. Uh, this, is, this is wrong to do that. You always have to put something before the quotation or something after it in the same sentence. You can't just have a sentence that's nothing but a quotation. Uh, so a good example there is the quoting sources can sometimes be difficult. Quote, even graduate students may struggle to cite sources correctly. So that last part is wrong. I need to put something in front of it. So you can fix it just by putting according to Barton, comma, or according to one scholar, comma. You know, anything like that is fine, but just don't have it standing all by itself. Now, an easy way to remember this is called the ICE method. So think about ICE, I-C-E, the I, introduce the quotation, the C, cite it, and E, explain it. Now, here's an example of this. So, the introduction. Matt Barton, comma, a professor of English at St. Cloud State University, comma, writes that, and then the citation. Now, this is necessary because uh, sometimes uh, the reader won't know who this person is that you're quoting, so it's kind of uh, pointless to even have the quotation in there, right? So the, the whole reason you're quoting somebody anyway is to build up your ethos. If the person has some credibility in the field, you quote the person, that builds up your credibility. So sometimes you have to introduce the person a little bit. Now, though, usually you don't need to do this if the reader will be familiar with the person. So Plato argues in the Republic that a just person is happy. So if I was writing a philosophy paper, I don't need to say Plato, comma, a Greek philosopher, comma. You know, the professor would think I was, uh, you know, <laughs> not really studying very hard or something if I didn't... Re if, not only did I uh, not seem to know that and had to put it in, but I'm kind of insinuating that he might not know that or she might not know that. Uh, bad idea. So if you're talking about Plato or some, you know, well-known figure, you don't have to explain who the person is. Uh, according to Smith, that's an introduction. Uh, Smith writes, you know, that's an introduction. But usually you probably want a little bit more in front of that to sort of set, set up the context so we know the reader has some idea why you're quoting this person. Okay, that's the I, now the C, cite. So Barton writes, comma, even graduate students may struggle to cite sources correctly. And then we got the page number 52. According to one English professor at St. Cloud State, comma, even graduate students may struggle to cite sources correctly. Then we have the last name and page number there. Now I will say one exception to this is if you are writing a science paper. If you're writing a, like a lab report or a, uh, you know, some type of uh, scientific study and you do some background, you usually have a section there where you talk about previous studies and the, the scientists really frown on it if you explain who the people are that you're quoting. So they just want to see the, they don't even want to see the person's first name. Just uh, something like H. Smith, J. Jones, and C, you know, whatever, uh, the quotations. And the reason for that is with science, it's not supposed to matter who did the experiment, uh, just that they reported the results, they did the experiment correctly. So they, they really kind of frown on that. Uh, other fields, though, are much more open to this, and some, in fact, even require it. Okay, explain as the E. Now, you always want to use quotations to support your points, not make your points. Uh, so what happens, uh, a lot of students, they, they're a little bit self-conscious or shy, I don't know what it is, but instead of just saying it, uh, they'll find somebody else that says it, and they'll just put it in there. Uh, that's not really what you're supposed to do, right? You're supposed to have something to say, and you're bringing in these other people to support your points. So here's an example. According to one English professor at St. Cloud State, uh, quote, even graduate students may struggle to cite sources correctly. Then we have something there to explain that quotation or repackage it or uh, try to show how we're going to use that. 
If even graduate students are having problems citing sources, professors are really expecting too much from their undergraduate students. Now, when should you quote directly? The only, there's only one reason to quote directly, and that is if the wording is significant somehow. So it comes up a lot, you'll see on sometimes in, in politicians or lawyers might use be, uh, you know, giving their side of the case and they'll say, you know, this person said, and I quote, and then they'll give the exact wording because there's something significant about it. Or the example here, Clinton stated that he, quote, did not have sexual relations with that woman. So, you know, obviously if you wanted to do talk about the situation, it might help if you knew the exact wording, not, you not, not just paraphrase it or, you know, put it in your own words. Sometimes that person's words are significant and that's when you quote it. Now you don't quote passages though if there's nothing significant about the way it's worded. So Jordan writes, comma, there were five chemists present during the experiment. Nobody cares about that wording and it's annoying that you quoted it. Now, what you really should do in those cases is put it in your own words. You'll still have the citation, uh, but you don't need to have the exact wording. It's not important to have the exact wording there. Now if the quotation is longer than three lines, uh, then you have to use a block quote. And basically what you do with that is uh, indent the whole thing over. Uh, the only problem is uh, professors usually don't like to see these because uh, it makes you look a bit lazy. You know, like, especially if you do it more than, uh, more than once in a paper, you know, it looks like you're just copying and pasting from other sources and not actually doing the, the writing yourself. So I would caution you away from these, um, especially don't quote more than a, maybe five lines tops and definitely don't do it more than maybe every five pages. If I were you, I would just avoid it entirely use these other methods, the uh, paraphrase and summarize instead. Maybe just quote a little bit of it, paraphrase the rest, or summarize the rest. Okay, so paraphrasing. Uh, now the paraphrase, you're taking the same ideas, but you're putting it in your own words. So here's an example of that. Uh, Simmons writes, comma, improving pedagogy necessitates the proper implementation of relevant training sessions and digital technologies for instructors. So we can paraphrase this, it's kind of wordy. We don't really like the wording anyway. So you could just say, according to Simmons, improving education means training teachers to use computers more effectively. Now you'll notice, if you look at those two examples, they're not the same wording. You know, we've really changed up the, the language there, the structure's not the same. It's not gonna be called plagiarism because we've put it into totally different words. Well, I'll show you some examples in a minute though where they don't change it up enough. Okay, so the guidelines are a good paraphrase. Uh, one, you really want to make sure you understand what the author is saying so that when you put it in your own words, you don't actually make the author sound like he or she is saying something different than what he or she actually wrote. So make sure you understand it. Uh, two, if there's, you know, you need to include the context. If the person was uh, being satirical or, or joking, uh, you need to make sure that's clear to the reader. If you just quote it, the joke, make it sound like it was a serious statement, that's obviously going to alter the author's intention. And, you know, lastly there, don't just change a few words around. You really have to revise the whole thing, otherwise you might be accused of plagiarism. So here's an example of uh, plagiarism and a paraphrase. So look at that first example, or the original passage is, the full extent of the corporate crime wave is hidden. Although the federal government tracks street crime month by month, city by city, through the FBI's uniform crime reports, it does not track corporate crime. So look at this plagiarized example. In Crime in the Suites, Mokaber has noted that the full extent of the corporate crime wave is hidden. The federal government does not track corporate crime, yet it does track street crime month by month, city by city, through the FBI's uniform crime reports. Uh, so this is kind of extreme, <clears throat> but I have seen students uh, you know, do this kind of work. Now if you look, you'll notice that a lot of this is almost word for word the same. They've changed it up a little bit, you know, shuffled it around uh, here and there, but it's still considered plagiarism. The chances of two authors writing more than maybe three or four words the same is, you know, almost impossible. So you know it's got to be intentional plagiarism when you see more than a few words that are repeated, you know, from source A to uh, source B. If they're not plagiarizing, almost every word will be different. So it's really hard to cover this up. So, you know, my advice when you're paraphrasing is do not look at the original source when you're trying to put it in your own words. Uh, what I like to do is read the source, uh, make a little bulleted list of the meaning, and shuffle it around so it's not even in the same order anymore, and then put that into my own words. And then when I'm done, I'll take a look at source A and source B again to make sure I didn't copy any, any uh, two or three more 
two or three or more words together. If I do, I have to change up that part some more. And also, you can't just go to a thesaurus and change up a few words that way. You have to change the order and the structure as well. <clears throat> also, though, I don't know if I mentioned this, but even though you paraphrase it and put it in your own words, you still have to put the citation, the page number where you can find the original passage. So look at this better example. In Crime of the Swedes, Smokerbur has noted that we lack information about the prevalence of corporate crime. While the FBI monitors crime statistics for the federal government on a monthly basis, it fails to do so for corporate crime. So some of those words are repeated, you know, corporate crime and so on, uh, but you definitely don't see whole passages copied. So that would uh, more than likely be okay with almost every professor. <clears throat> Okay, another way to use paraphrasing is if you want to take the language that's intended for a professional, scholarly audience and make it a more for a casual audience. Uh, so look at this example. Instead of searching for a job, some college graduates go into business for themselves after graduation, securing a loan for a franchise restaurant or store. So we can make that a little more casual by using the word you. After graduation, comma, you might consider opening your own burger joint or nail salon instead of rushing into the job market. So that's another thing you can do when you're paraphrasing is, you know, in the original example, they said franchise restaurant or store. Uh, so what we did here was plug in, you know, a type of restaurant, burger joint, and uh, instead of saying uh, store, we put a nail salon. <clears throat> okay, so lastly, that brings us to summaries. Now, a summary, the paraphrase pretty much is, has every idea from the original passage in your own words. Uh, the summary will just take the gist of the passage, maybe the key idea from it, and it's, in, it's still in your own words, but you don't have to, you know, have everything in there. Usually, uh, well, I would say maybe sometimes there's quotations, direct quotations in there. Might be some paraphrases too, uh, but it's usually, in any case, shorter than the original. And it probably will have simpler language. Maybe you simplify some concepts. <clears throat> so how do you summarize? All right, so here's some summaries. And, you know, one of my favorite places to look for summaries are a TV guide or a site where they describe or summarize movies for you. Uh, here's one about Harry Potter. <clears throat> the Harry Potter books are about a young boy with supernatural powers who attends a magical academy and struggles to defeat an evil wizard named Lord Voldemort. <laughs> so, you know, the Harry Potter books, I don't know, what is there, eight or nine of those? And they're huge books. But, you know, this pretty much summarizes the whole thing, right? Uh, two, writing an essay consists of five stages. Planning, drafting, editing, revising, and proofreading. You know? Uh, to summarize, there are many reasons not to smoke, but the dramatically increased risk of lung cancer tops the list. And then probably my, my favorite of all these is uh, four, and you can try to uh, figure out what movie this is or what series of movies. Uh, Hobbit finds ring, semicolon, trouble ensues. <clears throat> all right, so some tips for summarizing. Uh, one, you don't need to necessarily summarize the whole uh, book or the whole uh, you know document. You know, if somebody says, what's uh, the, the Hobbit about? You don't need to go, you know, every scene, every stage, you know, everything that happens and talk about it. You know, just the key, the key parts, or maybe there's only one part you want to discuss. So an example of that is uh, Plato's Phaedrus is a long and provocative discourse, but I am concerned here only with the story at the end about the invention of writing. In this story, Plato suggests four reasons why writing is actually harmful rather than helpful. So you get the idea, right? You just summarize the part of this thing that's important to you. Okay, a couple of last uh, notes here. Uh, one is, how do you keep track of these quotations and, and uh, all the paraphrasings and things that you want to use in your paper? Well, there are, of course, digital tools that you can use. I think I've uh, mentioned a few of those. I'll mention them again. But if you want to be old school with it, there's nothing wrong with just getting a stack of index cards. If you want to use these, uh, what I like to do is keep two separate stacks, one for the bibliography information. So if, you have, if there's an article you find or a book you want to use, you just uh, take one of those cards, you write out all the stuff that you need for the Works Cited page, and then you give it a code, usually the author's last name and then a number, J1, you know, B2, whatever. So then on your other set of cards, when you want to write down a quotation or a fact or something, you just put B2, because that goes with that other card, then you write out the fact. And then you have maybe four or five cards for B2, then some for C1 or however you've done it. <coughs> And what's nice about doing it with the index cards is that when you're done, you can lay all these out on the table and group them very easily. It's very easy to, you know, put all the uh, related cards together and you can write the paper. You just, you know, pick up the cards, quickly go through them, 
use that other stack to plug in your citations. So very handy. Uh, if you don't want to go old school though, you can of course use something like Evernote. Uh, these are all free by the way. There's Evernote, Zotero is one that plugs into your web browser. And then there's a RefWorks, uh, which St. Cloud State University supports. It's a little complicated, you know, but you know, if you know how to use it or you want to learn the interface, um, from what I hear anyway, I haven't used it myself, it's a, a very helpful tool. Okay, my uh, voice is just about to go here. Uh, so please let me know if you have any questions, any comments about this. I'm happy to help. Uh, you can talk to me here on YouTube or on Canvas. And good luck with your papers.